Jeff Albrecht? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Awesome. I, I hear you. I was looking for you on the list. Um, you ready? Um, yeah, I guess. Cool. Uh, <laughs> sorry to, to jump for you. <laughs> I'll give a couple minutes of intro so you can not. It, no worries. Uh, uh, yeah, so Jeff joins us from Arturo. He actually uh, uh, came to a Stack community event without a job uh, and left soon after with a job working with um, the Arturo crew. Um, ben Tuttle is a, a good friend of mine, and uh, he showed off a bunch of great things he did in Stack. And then uh, he disappeared for a bit uh, doing non-Stack stuff and has recently reemerged. And yeah, we're psyched to hear um, what Arturo is up to with um, Stack and Cog. Over to you, Jeff. Yeah, can you see these slides? Yep. OK, sweet. Um, yeah, so as Chris mentioned, my name is Jeff. I'm the geospatial engineer at Arturo. Um, Arturo is a, um, we're a property analytics company. We derive residential and commercial property char characteristics and predictions from satellite, aerial, and ground level imagery using applied machine learning, deep learning, etc. cetera. Um, I'll start off by giving an overview of kind of why we've chosen to use Stack and Cog and our cloud um, native geospatial architecture. Um, and then I'll go into some of the implementations that we've open sourced, some of the tools that we're using um, to do this. Um, so at a high level, these bullet points are basically the, the reasons why we chose to use Stack and Cog. I want to highlight a few things. Um, the first is uh, data provenance. So data provenance for machine learning shops is really important. Um, we use Stack internally to help better track relationships between model outputs and imagery metadata. And so this lets us answer important questions like um, what image was used to drive a particular model output and vice versa. Um, we can also then aggregate this information across the catalog so we can answer things like what is the average confidence score or F1 score of all model outputs from a particular image. We can look at how that trend has varied over time and space and really any type of query that we can do against Stack. We could look at it if we were using like Landsat. We could look at um, how cloud cover has an impact on uh, model inferences across a wide geographical region. Um, I also want to talk about interface standardization. This is one of the most important ones for why we chose Stack. Um, we actually use Stack as our internal representation of an image, um, which brings several nice benefits. It means that our system is compatible with any data set exposed to Stack. Um, this, of course, makes it easy to um, do research on new data sources. If we want to add like a new DSM data source, for example, like 3DEP, that's a lot easier now that Pixel 8 has gone in and turned that into a stack catalog at the recent software sprint. Um, it also lets us productionize around data sets a lot better, um, just because there's less code, there's less, um, there's, there's less like bending over backwards that we need to do when we do add a new data provider. And some of our data providers even natively support Stack. Um, our most recent one that we partnered with is Nearspace Labs. And I know that one of their engineers is giving a talk later today on how they're using <coughs> protobufs um, to serve uh, Stack. Um, so the interface standardization, I think, is super important. Um, on the COG side, COGs are really valuable to us at Artero because of their flexibility. Um, you can uh, structure them in different ways. Um, you can change the internal block size. You can switch up the compression you're using, and that gives you fast and efficient access to pixels for various use cases. Um, it's protocol agnostic. You can wrap any of the standard imagery serving protocols around a cog and be able to serve that imagery using that protocol. Um, so it gives us flexibility. Um, also important is the limited pre-processing overhead. Um, at Arturo, one of the unique aspects of our um, use case is that everything happens on the fly. Everything is done with streaming data. Um, so we need data to be accessible and available as quickly as possible. Most of our images are about the extent of a property at pretty high resolution. So it doesn't actually take very long to convert it into a cog and then do the rest of the processing on the fly um, from the source data. Um, of course, we also save a lot of money using COG um, because you can make them really, really small with uh, various compressions. Um, also serving, dynamically serving tiles and serving the imagery from the, um, uh, from the COG is actually pretty cheap um, with the right architecture. And there's good software tooling around um, working with COG and serving uh, tiles. Um, so now onto the, some of the tools we've built uh, real quick. Um, the first one is Stack Pydantic. Um, Pydantic is essentially, it lets, it's essentially Python objects that act as validators. 
Um, they let you validate uh, pieces of Python, uh, pieces of data using Python type hints. Um, we use this in turn, we've basically converted the stacks back to these models. So this is kind of what an item looks like. If you're familiar with the spec, this should look very similar. Um, and then for example, an item might contain a list of links in the links membership, and then you can see the link member there as well. Um, we use Stack Pydantic as the basic building block for most of our stack applications, just because it gives us a nice object-oriented way to um, dealing with stack to validate. Um, and there's some other nice stuff, like it adds uh, type hinting um, in, in IDEs, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, so this is kind of the basic building block that we use. Um, our API was just open sourced about two weeks ago. Um, the first real version will come out uh, hopefully by the end of the data sprint on the 15th. Um, it's a Python library that is designed to build a stack compliant API. It does ship a API with the library, but it's more designed to help people build and customize their own stack APIs. It uses fast API and Postgres in the back end. It supports all the stack API extensions and it's supporting a growing list of what we are calling add-ons, which are integrations that aren't exactly supported by the stack spec, but add value. The first add-on we've added is essentially an integration with this, uh, with the cog tile server called uh, T-Tiler. Um, I actually don't wanna talk about that too much now because I'm gonna be giving a uh, workshop on this at 1140, which is in what, two hours and 10 minutes. So if you're interested in hearing more about the API, just please show up to that workshop and you'll get the whole demo. Um, the last bit that I wanna talk about, as I mentioned, um, we can productionize, pr productionize around um, stack data sets. That's kind of how we designed everything. And so one of the things that we do if we wanna add a data set to our stack is we turn it into a stack API. Um, so this summer we partnered with a company called Motiv um, to do a summer internship to um, create and basically ETL, the NEIP on AWS data into our stack API. Um, that's also going to be released at the end of the upcoming data sprints. Um, so hopefully by September 15th, um, there'll be a blog post and some other publicity around it. Um, so keep an eye out for that if you're interested in using NEIP through stack. Um, and that's it for my talk. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Zach, are you here? Yes. Awesome. Um, so yeah, Zach joins us from Amazon Web Services. Um, you want to share your screen? Um, yeah. And yeah, they were super early with supporting Cloud Native Geospatial with Landsat and then have expanded to Earth on AWS. And I think he's going to share all about their open data program. Over to you, Zach. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So hi, I'm Zach Fleming. I'm the tech lead for the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative. I'm also on the AWS Open Data team where I mostly deal with open weather and climate data. Um, so today I just want to talk to you very briefly about what we're doing with the Open Data Program. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard it of it before, but if you haven't, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Uh, so first, we want to really want to talk about why we're interested in this. Uh, and one of these things that we like to do at AWS is removing the undifferentiated heavy lifting. And uh, if you haven't seen it before, we really like this quote from Data Driven by DJ Patel and Hilary Mason. And it says, data must be organized, well documented, and consistently formatted and error-free. Cleaning the data is often the most taxing part of data science and is frequently 80% of the work. And so when we see something like that, where we see you know, a number like 80% of the work are in here around cleaning up the data and making the data available and things like that, we think, oh, there's an opportunity where AWS may be able to help out the community. And so that's really what we're trying to do with the AWS Open Data Program. And so if you're not familiar with it, it covers the cost of storage for publicly available high value cloud optimized data sets. And we work with data providers who are seeking to democratize access to their data by making it available for analysis on AWS to develop new cloud native techniques and formats and tools that effectively lower the cost of working with the data. Um, so this is really, you know, this group here in this community here in Stack, what we're uh, trying to do. Um, you know, when we see all these things like cloud optimized geotiffs and things like that, you know, those are initiatives that we're really happy to support and help um, groups figure out how to work with these data sets and how to make uh, the most value out of them. And, you know, and the third bullet point here is really encouraging the development of these communities. Um, so obviously, you know, we're supporting this group uh, and, you know, we support a lot of others that I'll talk about uh, sort of in my last slide as well. Uh, one of the main aspects of our program that we run, uh, aside from just covering the cost of the storage, is that we run the registry of open data on AWS. So if you're participating in the open data program, you have to lift your, list your data set on here. 
Um, so this is just at registry.opendata.aws. You can go check that out. Uh, you'll see sort of in the background of the slide here, I've listed some of the uh, sort of Earth-based data sets that we have, geospatial data sets. Uh, I've also highlighted in uh, orange some of the ones that are already in Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF or that have a stack. Uh, so I think there may be more. Uh, I think there, you know, obviously we're hoping to add a few more. I see uh, we have NAPE on here. It'd be very cool to be able to list out um, the stack API for that in the future. I know Seawers already has a stack API for that. There's also like a, an SNS feed where you can get notifications when new scenes are available uh, in the stack format. Uh, and then Sentinel-3, Sentinel-5P, uh, uh, the national blend of models from NOAA, and uh, NOAA's er emergency response imagery, those are all already available in cloud-optimized geotiffs. Uh, we also have some examples around sort of the Sentinel-2 and the and Landsat-8 also being available in cloud-optimized geotiffs. Uh, so we're really hoping to be able to expand this to show um, more of the use cases around why these are good for these various disciplines too. Uh, I think that, you know, we're, we're working a lot in this community to be able to show some of the advantages of having uh, cloud optimized data sets uh, and really that it helps you advance your science. It helps you um, get to the answers you're looking for quicker and it helps you deal with these, uh, in some cases, very large data sets that are petabyte scale alone, right? And so, you know, in doing all of this, we can really uh, benefit the community and we can let the community be able to work with the data for faster and for cheaper. Um, so the final slide is just, you know, some of the examples of blog posts we have uh, where we're promoting innovation and enabling knowledge exchange. So I encourage you to go check out these blog posts. These are all in the AWS blog. Most of them are in the, the public sector blog. Um, so we're highlighting various use cases here where we're looking at solar energy forecasting, um, just enabling access to data from different national Met offices, the FEMAWARI 8, um, developing, you know, open training data sets. Uh, looking at ecosystems, uh, looking at climate risk, and of course, Digital Earth Africa. Um, so hopefully, you know, there will be some good examples from the sprint where we can write some blog posts on that as well. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in that, you can uh, reach out to me as well. That's all I have today. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> I need like an applause button. These are all great talks. <laughs> it's always so unsatisfied when you're like, and I'm done. <laughs> um, awesome. Caitlin, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Awesome. You want to share your screen? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Kaylin joins us from Maxar, where she's been doing a lot of Stack implementation, and they've been a, a early supporter of Stack. And yeah, I'm super excited to, to hear what they've been up to. Over to you, Kaylin. Yeah. So hello, my name is Kaylin Mahana, and I'm a developer at Maxar. Today, I'm going to be given just a quick overview of how Maxar's implemented Stack. So first, we'll start with why Stack. Um, I'm part of a recently formed group called the Content Hub, and one of the tasks that my group was chartered with was consolidating all the various data sets um, in Maxar into one centralized location that users throughout the company could quickly and eff effectively search um, just to determine what raster assets were available to them. We found that Stack was the perfect vehicle to implement this requirement. Stack gave us the ability to standardize schemas and metadata for similar items, such as imagery collected by the same satellite and sensor. Over the past year, we've been able to organize Maxar's imagery, as well as other derived products, such as mosaics, into various stack collections that make up our entire archive catalog. Having this standardized spec gave us the capability to not only create a cohesive catalog of our own assets, but we're now able to ingest and incorporate data from third parties into our catalog as well. What we have found as we worked on creating this catalog is now that there's a data standard for us to follow, we've been able to help normalize how platforms across the company use and interact with data. This has led to fewer one-off data stores where data is duplicated um, for one specific process or project, and fewer data stores has led to decreased costs for the company. Moving forward, we'd like to be able to build off the foundation we laid with this initial catalog and eventually get to the point where Maxar is delivering uh, finished products with stack metadata. So there are three main components of our stack implementation. Um, we have a static catalog that we store in AWS as three buckets, a dynamic catalog that lives in an AWS or a Postgres database, and an API that sits on top of our dynamic catalog. We decided to create both a static and dynamic catalog to give our users the most flexibility possible when it comes to searching for and using Maxar raster assets. The static catalog in S3 has been useful in scenarios where customers want to crawl and view our data in bulk. 
The dynamic catalog and API has been useful where customers are, ser are searching for certain images or products that meet specific search criteria. One of the main concerns that we had with maintaining two catalogs that live in separate locations was how do we keep those catalogs in sync? To solve this issue, we created a process that we call our dynamic catalog ingest process. And this workflow migrates stack items that are written in our static catalog in S3 to our dynamic catalog. This process is triggered by S3 write events that get generated whenever something gets written to S3. Once triggered, a combination of AWS lambdas and step functions is used to read those stack items from S3, validate them against the stack spec, and then write them to our dynamic catalog database. Here's just a quick video of an item getting written to our static catalog and then being ingested to our dynamic catalog using the process I just described. So before we ingest the new item, I'm making a quick call to our API to show that the item I'm about to ingest isn't in our dynamic catalog. Once that returns, I kick off our ingest process by writing a stack item to our static catalog S3 bucket. Here's the state machine instance that was invoked by the S3 write event. Um, the most time consuming step in this process is validating the item against the stack spec. Once the state machine has completed, I make the same request to our APIs before. You can see now that I'm able to view that newly ingested item in our dynamic catalog. I know that was pretty quick. Hopefully that gave you all a little more insight into how we're using Stack at Maxar. Um, if anyone li would like to talk further in depth about our general implementation or have questions about um, that ingest process, here's the contact information for myself and two other developers that are working on the project. Um, feel free to reach out to us at any time. We're happy to answer any questions that come our way. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Stop uh, sharing. Yes. Um, cool. Drew, are you online? Yep, I'm here. Uh, awesome. Uh, so you want to share your screen? Um, yep, give me just one second. Drew comes from Element 84 um, that's been doing a lot of great stack support and they do, they lead a lot of development of the common metadata repository um, to search all of NASA data. And Drew's gonna share about the, the stack interface into that huge vast data set. Over to you. All right, thank you. Yep, uh, as you said, I am Drew Daniel and I am a, a junior developer over at Element 84. And I'm gonna be talking about CMR stack um, so to start off, what is CMR Stack? Uh, it is a public API that exposes NASA's common metadata repository using stack compliant endpoints. But what does that actually mean? Um, so the common metadata repository is uh, to pluck the verbiage straight from their website, uh, NASA's public continuously evolving metadata system that catalogs all data and service metadata records for NASA's Earth Observing System uh, Data and Information System. Uh, basically, just a repository of geospatial metadata records. Uh, and as stated earlier, uh, they have a huge number of records from a bunch of different providers. Uh, just to name a few, there's like the Atmospheric Science Data Center, uh, USGS's Earth Resource Observation and Science Center, and the Land Processes Distributed Ar Active Archive Center. <laughs> All right, so why did we create CMR Stack? Uh, CMR stack, or C, I'm sorry, CMR can be a little bit difficult to access. Uh, there are a ton of records and uh, it's kind of their own metadata standard. And we wanted to be able to enable easy access to the growing stack community. Um, the other goal we had was to allow established stack tooling to access all the data within CMR. All right, so a little bit on how it works. Uh, it's a serverless proxy API, so it just acts as a translation layer between the two metadata formats. Uh, requests are made according to the stack specification, uh, then it's translated into a CMR search query. It takes, or it, uh, I'm sorry, it pings CMR search with that query, and the response is then translated from the CMR standard back into the stack standard. Uh, there are a couple different ways to use CMR stack. Um, one is through crawling the JSON in the browser, uh, which is what this image on the right side is. Uh, essentially, you just click through uh, catalogs, collections, and items, um, sticking to the stack spec as much as we could. Uh, we had to do something a little bit different, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, 
But the other way to access this is from REST API calls. You know, you can use Postman or uh, whatever tool you prefer using either get requests or post requests with a JSON body. Uh, or you can use stack tooling. Uh, one that we used to test this was uh, stat search. So these, should, or these are, all of these provider catalogs have stack compliant endpoints that should be able to be used with uh, whatever tooling you prefer. A little bit on what was implemented. Uh, we were able to implement all of the core stack spec. Um, version 1.0.0 beta 1 came out a uh, few weeks into this recent or most recent uh, sprint going through the development. Uh, so we were able to build to that. We also had enough time to implement the uh, stack API extensions, or at least a number of them. Uh, we were able to get through context and fields to specify you know, what you want back from your query, uh, as well as being able to query giving um, yeah, inequalities or specify like you want all records with cloud cover greater than a certain number or you know, what have you, and also the, uh, the sort extension. Oh, hang on one second. Seems to, <laughs> sorry, my computer seems to have frozen a little bit. Nope, too far. All right, so uh, a couple challenges that we had along the way. Uh, one was querying CMR. Uh, so as I said before, CMR is huge. There are a ton of records. Um, and something that comes along with that is CMR search does not allow you to query all of it. Like you can't say, I want all records from a specific date. Uh, it'll throw back an error that says, hey, there are way too many. We, you, you gotta narrow it down. Uh, so one thing we did to uh, kind of get around that was we broke it down by provider. Um, we created a catalogs for every provider. So there's one for LPDAC, there's one for ESA, uh, et cetera. Um, and then within each provider catalog, you have links to crawl through the browser or a stack compliant search link. Um, there were another challenge we faced was that CMR's search, their, their response were missing a few fields that are required by the stack spec. Uh, one in particular was the uh, collections in CMR don't necessarily have to have a bounding box. They just have their geometry, be it a polygon, a line, what have you. Um, so we had to do a small conversion to get, uh, to get the bounding box out of that geometry as well as keep that geometry, uh, which kind of ran us into a, a second little issue of converting from Cartesian to geodetic coordinates to make sure that that bounding box actually encapsulated all of the area of interest in the CMR collection. Uh, the final thing that we had a little bit of stumbling on the early part of this, uh, this project was running it with serverless. Uh, so everything on the back end is Node, no JavaScript. Um, and we're running an express server inside of an AWS Lambda. And at the time, that was a bit of a foreign concept for the development team. So that was just a little thing that we got to gain some experience with. Ah, sorry about this. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, you can check it out or use it, what have you, uh, whatever you'd like. Um, but we have it at cmr.earthdata.com, or sorry, nasa.gov slash cmrstack as well as the documentation for it at nasa.gov slash cmrstack slash docs. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Let me stop your share. Yeah. Ed, are you ready to go? I think we're going to try to bring FANG and Digital Earth Africa um, back in. Um, I think you didn't quite stop sharing yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> a little unfamiliar with Zoom. There we go. Yeah, no problem. Let's try again. Nope. Yeah, too quiet. Sorry. Uh, let's jump to the next one. Anderson, are you on? Yes, I am. Awesome. You are up. Good. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. You can see my screen, right? Yep. Go. Go. Take it away. Good. Um, 
Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, so my name is Anderson Vanihirwe. I work as a software engineer at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, and today I'm going to talk about ZAR. Um, so why should you care? Uh, so geospatial data come in several different formats and some of them are really traditional in the sense that we've had them for quite some time. They've proven themselves to be effective for traditional uh, disk storage, but they tend to be less efficient for modern cloud forecast technologies. Um, and there's ongoing effort to develop newer cloud optimized data formats, uh, such as uh, cloud optimized GeoTIFF, and you have uh, TalDB and ZAR, which is uh, what I'm going to be focusing on in my talk. So another reason you should probably care is that there's a growing list of analysis ready public geospatial data set in ZAR format, uh, both in Google and Amazon, at least those are the ones that I've checked. So there could be some other data sets uh, in Azure um, or some other uh, public cloud provider that I'm not aware of. Um, so what is ZAR? So at its core, ZAR is mostly a data model specification, uh, which basically provides protocol for storing and, share, uh, and retrieving chunked compressed multidimensional arrays. And what this means is that since it's a spec, you could basically have several implementations in different programming languages. Um, and as of today, uh, so the ZAR spec is implemented in, in Python, which, which is the most popular, but which is when you hear people talking about ZAR, they tend to focus on the Python implementation, but there's an implementation TypeScript uh, in C++, Julia, Java, Scala, and C. And what this means is that you could basically write data from one programming language and access it from another programming language, as long as they implement the same version of the spec. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few features or core features of ZAR. So at its core, so you have uh, what they call a group, which the way to think about it is that in a group, you basically have a collection of variables. Um, so a group will have its own metadata and attributes. And then inside a group, as I said, you have a collection of arrays, which also have their own metadata and their own attributes. And then a bunch of uh, chunks or binary uh, chunks of data. Um, so let me now switch gears and show you what some of these features look like uh, in the Python implementation. So what I'm doing here, I'm basically creating like an umpy array and then I'm chunking it uh, in chunks of 10 by 200 by 100. Um, so what I end up getting is basically to the end user, it just looks like a regular numpy array, but it, under the hood it's chunked, which means that you can basically operate, it, operate on it chunk by chunk. Um, and then, so the next feature is actually the compression. So if you're using the Python implementation, there's this package called numcodex that basically provides like a high level API for configuring compression and filters for the ZAR arrays. So you can choose uh, which type of compression you want. In this case, you have option to choose uh, between lossless or lossy compression. So going back to my example, so uh, I didn't actually specify uh, a compressor, but there's a default option. And in this case, basically ZAR uses the, the BLOSK compressors, the default, um, uh, and it sets a bunch of other defaults, but you can basically change those depending on uh, your needs. And as you can see, the total array of, uh, the total size of the array is 38 megabytes, but when you compress it, you're only left with 1.3 megabytes. And this is what's gonna be saved on this, or if you save it. Um, and then, um, so as you can see, so this uh, M4 uh, attribute basically gives you a bunch of uh, information about uh, your ZAR array. Um, so when it comes to storage, you have quite a lot of options. Um, and the key takeaway here is that you can basically save a ZAR array in any key value store. So you can save it in a database. Uh, in this case, there's an existing uh, um, implementation to save uh, ZAR arrays in SQLite, uh, Redis, MongoDB. Uh, you can save it uh, on a POSIX file system in a directory structure or a zip store. You could save it uh, in the cloud object storage, uh, or you could basically bring your own, as long as it's a, it's a key value store, ZAR will basically allow you to save the array uh, uh, in that store. Uh, 
uh, of your choice. So again, I did just provide a, like a high level overview. Um, so if you actually want to learn more about how Zara is actually being used, so I uh, invite you to check uh, these two talks by uh, Amy, uh, and I'm pretty sure she's gonna go into more details than I did. Um, and with that, I'll basically hand it over to Chris. Awesome, thanks so much. Thanks. Okay, let me stop share. sharing, yeah. Uh, Simone, Simone, I'm not sure how to say your name, I apologize. Are you there? Simone, Simone, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go. You share your screen. Yes, can you see the screen? Yep, take it away. Okay, so hi everybody. From the good morning to the good night, <laughs> uh, due to the large audience, I think we are touching all the UTM zones uh, today. <laughs> Uh, my name is Simone Mantovani, and uh, in the next five minutes, I'm going to stall some of your time to talk about uh, our experience with uh, Stack and uh, Cloud Optimized Geotiff uh, to enable pixel-based access services uh, on top of the Sentinel 5P uh, data. Uh, I'm working in a small company on the planet Earth, still on planet Earth uh, in uh, Italy, Ferrara, uh, since. Uh, uh, 15 years, 16 years. Uh, I was a physicist uh, before uh, with a focus on uh, microphysics uh, uh, of, uh, of clouds. Then I came across with this uh, remote sensing business and uh, started uh, cooperating with the European Space Agency and uh, uh, the European Union uh, uh, to improve uh, uh, the access uh, to the geospatial data. And uh, by today, I'm leading uh, a technical team that is uh, keen on uh, democratizing the access to the geospatial data into the cloud. You might have already realized that I'm a boring guy because uh, I'm still focused on cloud <laughs> since a lot. Uh, but to share, uh, let's say, uh, the long trip uh, that it was, uh, uh, and that is, has been already touched by the others, uh, we know how many challenges uh, we came across uh, in the last uh, years, uh, uh, talking about the volume of the data and the variety of the data. And uh, by the end, uh, we finally uh, managed to uh, provide uh, and support the European Space Agency and other uh, data providers uh, in uh, enabling uh, uh, an advanced access service that is able to uh, manage uh, global data uh, but also extract uh, uh, a regional data set from uh, uh, the global one and uh, moving uh, field to the single pixel at the end uh, is possible to, uh, to extract uh, an evolution uh, uh, over a single pixel. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going uh, into the technical details uh, because I'm not a software engineer, but uh, what I would share is the typical use case that we have to manage uh, to enable uh, such a service and uh, what is the impact on the or what is the uh, lesson learned when we talk about uh, uh, the different user communities. At the end there is a common uh, use case across uh, several communities and uh, users have a need to discover it, to discover and get access to single granules. You see on the left side uh, uh, the, uh, the GIF that is uh, uh, running. Maybe there is a need uh, to uh, apply some processing uh, to generate uh, uh, a daily mosaic or to extract even a single pixel, as I was uh, mentioning. And this, at the end, uh, is uh, CPU and storage time uh, uh, consuming. We did this uh, with uh, the main goal of uh, avoiding data duplication. No? And uh, you can imagine uh, that the different performances uh, are uh, 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 applicable to different uh, data sets, uh, to different uh, infrastructure. Then a day I was in the main square and I came across to stack uh, and cloud optimized GeoTIFF. You see my face. I was in trouble and the first reaction was, okay, we have another standard, we have another data format and uh, I would make the long story uh, very short because we heard by uh, Matthias in the morning and Chris uh, uh, earlier about uh, the benefit of these uh, uh, new standards and uh, data format and how they support and boost the exploitation of, uh, of the data. So going to the end, uh, 
We did it for the Copernicus Sentinel 5P data. No? Copernicus, if you are not familiar with uh, uh, Sentinel 5P, uh, let's uh, uh, consider it as a simple camera that takes pictures. No? And uh, uh, these pictures uh, are chemicals uh, in the atmosphere. Different uh, chemicals have different properties, in some cases, different uh, data structure or uh, data format. Uh, what we did, uh, as uh, introduced, uh, was to set up uh, uh, for Sentinel 5P uh, under the umbrella of the Open Data Registry, uh, the uh, Sentinel 5P Level 2 uh, data set. Um, Chris introduced uh, or highlighted uh, in his slides uh, that for a Sentinel 5P, a stack catalog and cloud optimized uh, GeoTIFF uh, uh, version exists. Uh, and you know now who is the responsible for, uh, for, this, uh, for this job. Uh, you know the structure, uh, you see that uh, there is uh, a minimal uh, uh, description that could be improved and increased, uh, uh, as well as uh, the user example. But to going uh, into the uh, today topic, uh, you see that uh, a catalog of the data set exists, uh, and this catalog uh, is a, a stack uh, catalog. What we uh, collect uh, on, uh, on AWS uh, uh, is both uh, the native data format because of scientists. You know scientists, they are really precise. They want to uh, redo uh, the full process uh, uh, from uh, uh, the A to Z. So for them, we are uh, centralizing on AWS, uh, the native data format. Uh, but you see that uh, there is uh, a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF uh, uh, option. And uh, you can uh, click by click browse uh, the content uh, and discover uh, how the data are uh, made available uh, through uh, the AWS uh, storage. You can use uh, being a human uh, uh, the browser or being uh, machine to machine and the API described uh, uh, earlier. But what is important is that as a human, I came across to the special coverage of the data uh, I need uh, and uh, I have an idea of, uh, uh, of the temporal coverage. So going back to the typical uh, use case or to the common uh, workflow uh, is uh, stack and cloud optimize uh, uh, GeoTIFF uh, changing the approach to the data? No, because the user still need to discover, get access, apply processing. But what these uh, uh, standards are providing is uh, a benefit uh, in the uh, effort uh, machine or human uh, that uh, users spend on, uh, on the data. So this is our contribution to uh, the uh, cloud optimize uh, and stack uh, uh, initiative. And uh, if I would share, uh, if I can share my, let's say, face uh, after uh, uh, the long fighting with the technical team, I think that uh, my recommendation is uh, do it better with stack and do it better with the uh, cog because at the end uh, uh, you will save uh, your time in exploiting uh, the data. So here we, we go. Please visit uh, the Open Data Registry of uh, Amazon. And uh, for any feedback, uh, feel free to send us uh, an email to the, uh, to the contact. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Emmanuel, are you ready to go next? We've had some little shifts in our schedule. Um, yes. Awesome. Okay. You want me to pause for a bit so you can set up? <laughs> Oh, there yeah. you go. Uh, yeah, Emmanuel, I'll do a quick intro. Uh, we actually, I re met, met him recently. He joined the, the software sprint um, and gave one of the, the coolest um, contributions there um, with a, a .NET library to add to the stack ecosystem. Um, over to you. Yes, uh, so I'm, uh, my name is Emmanuel Mato. I'm a software engineer and technical leader at Teradue, uh, semi providing data processing platforms for Earth science. And we are dealing actually with a lot of uh, satellite imagery. So we got uh, interested in stack uh, early spring and we almost immediately, um, let's say, uh, adopted uh, stack uh, because we saw the, the powerful of the, of the syntax of the 
of the specification. So we had to, to adapt our system to talk stack and there was no system, uh, no library for .NET as our system are developed in .NET. So we decided to go for an implementation of stack in .NET. So that's what I'm gonna present you now, that's .NET uh, stack, which is .NET library to help you work with stack, uh, catalog, collection items. So in a nutshell, stack um, allows you to, of course, serialize, deserialize JSON document and then uh, manipulate them with enhanced uh, object in C sharp with uh, objects representing geometries, timestamps, numerical values, and many more so stuff like uh, the via the stack extension plugins engine. So technically it's very quick. Uh, it's uh, already .NET Core ready with a .NET standard framework. We are uh, implementing, we have implemented the core stack spec uh, 1.0 uh, beta 2, some extension, and we rely mainly on Newton soft JSON for serialization, deserialization, and GeoJSON.NET for GeoJSON encoding. Now I'm uh, moving to this uh, notebook for uh, showing you in live what is going. So um, Stack uh, comes as a, as a package you can install. Uh, the first feature is of course the serialization of Stack documents. So like here you can load an online, uh, an online catalog like this one of Seabirds on, on Amazon. You can of course navigate uh, on the catalog uh, with uh, embedded functions like get children, get items, uh, assets, and uh, many more accessories to see the ID, the description, the values, etc. And at the end, you can parse easily a catalog. Uh, also, with uh, like the stack. Uh, the a collection. Analyze it with a, a JSON compatible. But what I like is because that with an encoding that you can comp, uh, let's say, an extension and you know equal the sar that part of the, the library and the system of which allows you to tier a to have a, an engine that can extend uh, that can extract let's say the uh, satellite stack extension as an object that retrieves you, of course, the information like the relative orbit, the orbit states, etc. But after you can also include and embed more functions, like for instance here, to load the orbital state vectors inside of, of the uh, of the satellite uh, items. Like for here, for instance, you have embedded function to load the orbital state vectors that gives you the position and the velocity in time. This uh, information can be really useful when you do search to, to find, uh, to calculate, for instance, this second function, which is a perfect calculation of a, a baseline between two satellites uh, seen, like, uh, for instance, when you do interferometric uh, processing. And here, for instance, I implemented a quick uh, calculation of the baseline between two, the two scenes we have loaded before and using the orbital state vector, we are able to calculate the distance between the two satellites uh, over the Earth, which was here 10 meters. So the purpose of this example is not, of course, to, to calculate the baseline, but to show you how we can build capacity building in the plugin, in the library, to bring more stuff into the stack. So that's all for the library. This library is available here uh, on GitHub. You can also launch a binder to test and redo the notebook I have just presented you. And just to close quickly, I am uh, right now implementing using uh, .NET Stack, a command line tool that will allow to um, have some kind of command line interface 
to load and uh, navigate through a stack catalog, but other also catalog to list, to copy, and to extract information. That's it. Thank you. Awesome. Looks great. Um, thanks so much. Uh, can you stop share? Uh, Evan? Evan? Hi. Hey. Can you hear me? Yep. You want to share your screen? Okay. Can you see my screen? I cannot. No. <laughs> There, that's better. Okay, so my name is Evan Roux and I'm one of the GDAL developers. Um, first, I'd like to demystify a bit what a COG file is. People might believe it is a new format, but a COG file is just a plaintive file indeed. So COG is just a smarter way of organizing information within a TIFF file to make it very efficient for reader code to extract part of it. For that, you just need to store COG files on an HTTP file server, possibly using cloud storage solutions, and have a reader that is able to retrieve subset of the file without downloading it entirely. Let's have a look at the structure of a TIFF file at a high level. So a TIFF file starts with just a tiny sign signature identif identifying the TIFF format, and it's then followed by one or more images. And typically, you will have one single image which holds the uh, imagery at full resolution, but in the geo field, we often happen to it overviews or pyramids that are some sampled views of it. And some images can also be bitmap masks to store an alpha channel, typically when using JPEG compression. If we now look at a single image, which is called an IFD uh, in TIFF parlance, it's made of a header that store metadata in TIFF tags. Among those tags, uh, you can find georeferencing, but you will also have an array to store the offsets at which tiles are found in the file, and another one to store the, st the size in bytes of each tile. If you combine the two previous slides, you can see that a TIFF file is kind of a noodle plate with tons of sections linking to other ones, and uh, of course, this, this, this is kind of powerful because we, we can move things around and to optimize them uh, as, uh, as, as we want for our purpose. So the main idea of a, a COG file is to make sure that all metadata information, that is the list of the IFDs and their metadata is put at the very beginning of the file so that it can be retrieved in a single HTTP request. Then we'll typically put the pixel data for the smaller overview. And at the end of the file, you will find the pixel da data for the full resolution image. So such organization could, for example, allow service to stream files and offer progressive rendering. Now let's, let's come to, to the, the main uh, topic of, the, of this talk. So uh, how, how can we use GDAL to create Cogs. So starting with uh, GDAL 3.1, it's, uh, it's very simple. It's just as uh, simple as this uh, command line, GDAL translate source.tif mycog.tif-ofcog. And you can, uh, and in doing so, it will automatically generate overviews and do reprojection uh, if, if needed. Uh, we have several options to define the compression method, the tile size, which resampling method to use for overview generation and reprojection and possibly a tiling scheme such as a web mercator one so that TIFF files, TIFF tiles, sorry, can exactly match uh, the ones for the tiling scheme. And with the upcoming GDAL 3.2 version, you can even uh, specify your own tiling scheme if you follow the relevant OGC standard that describes it. Um, tile generation, the generation can also be, be multi-threaded. So it's now time for a little demo. So here I, uh, I decide to, to create a COG file uh, using a JPEG compression with a quality of 90%. Uh, and reprojecting uh, using the web mercator tiling scheme. Um, 
I define also that uh, we must have uh, three uh, zoom levels where uh, the code tiles exactly match the ones from uh, Google Mercator. And I also specify the, the number of threads. So it completed before I, I finished uh, describing uh, what, what I, I wanted to do. And so now let's look at the content of the file. Uh, so you can see here that is it. It's a Geotiff file. It uses my Mercator projection. It has JPEG compression. And uh, we can see also that it's recognized uh, as a COG file. And Hello, the Andy. number Your of. Uh, I'm an Earth Civilization data sorry. scientist working at Geoscience Hospital. Sorry. And so, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, now, uh, if we look at the, the reader side, uh, let's imagine we want to read the sub-window of the file that inter intersects the, the six ties uh, you, you can see here on the sketch. So the GDAL reader uh, will issue three parallel get range requests. So let's demo that quickly. And uh, so here you, you could see that it completed very, very quickly. Um, and uh, here's this new option, uh, which is uh, the display of uh, network statistics, which is uh, something new to GDAL 3.2, uh, shows you uh, that it only uh, issued four uh, HTTP GET requests and that the number of bytes uh, uh, was a uh, that were extracted from the network was 320 kilobytes. Um, and uh, if we look at the details, uh, we can see that uh, uh, first a 16 kilobyte request uh, was issued to, to get the metadata area at the beginning of the file. And uh, the bulk of the download is uh, actually in this read multi-range request where that uh, is the extraction of the pixel data, data that uh, we needed for, for the ties for we, we wanted to, to extract. And that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Evan. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yeah, uh, just a second. Uh, ah. Steve, sir, you up? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. I uh, cannot yet share. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to figure out uh, where is my. Ah. Uh, Zoom. So... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just. Well, I'll give an intro as you figure it out. To... Eve. Um, so yeah, I think Eve showed up, uh, joined us a, a couple sprints ago, um, and they're um, working with ESA and exposing a, a lot of um, data available. Um, you know, he's been working, leading a lot of the um, OGC open search um, standards and, and joined up to, you want to share your screen, um, uh, to help do compatibility with Stack, which is super cool to see. Um, so over to you, Yves. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Uh, so I'm Yves Kuhn. I'm working for Spacebar. I'm a contractor for the European Space Agency. I'm going to talk about the stack implementation that we do for the ESA FEDEO system. Uh, so what is the ESA FEDEO system? We're going to explain shortly, the, briefly, the history and the evolution and what role is stack playing in this uh, environment. Uh, so ESA FEDEO is part of what is called the CIOS uh, connected data assets. So the idea is CIOS is the, the agency uh, organizing the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. Uh, they are trying to make available all the Earth Observation mission data from a lot of space agencies. On the North American side, we have NASA taking care of a system called CIVIC that you see on the left of this picture. And ESA is taking care of a system which is called FEDEO, which is basically access to European missions and Canadian missions, including ESA missions uh, from Copernicus, third party, Heritage and Earth Explorer. So all of these things are using the same type of interfaces. Uh, and this is where we are for the moment evolving towards uh, stack. Uh, 
So the system was developed initially in 2012 uh, based on OGC CSW catalog, so catalog service for the web. The current implementation, however, is based on Earth Observation Open Search, so OGC specification, uh, with Atom responses. And all the agencies are implementing this, and this is unified through the system that I just showed on the previous slide. In addition, it's implementing CEO's best practice uh, specification, which basically means that we do a two-step search, based first uh, searching for Earth Observation collections, and then trying to find the products inside, inside this collection, which is the same approach that CMR, by the way, is, uh, is following. So on the ESA side for metadata for collections, we are for the moment based on Inspire metadata. And for the granules, we are using uh, observation and measurement, which is an OGC specification. So this is the current status. So, so for the moment, we are working for ESA on an ESA Ergo project, which is preparing the new version of the implementation, which will be fully based on API features, uh, the core specification. Uh, open API, because we want to have a read-write access. Uh, basically, we're going to have tools that are able to, to manipulate the metadata inside the catalog as well. And still, we are working on open search, but this time we are using GeoJSON response format. Uh, and we are, will support three different feature types. So the Earth Revision Collections, uh, based on OGC specs. So it's an application metadata and product metadata, also based on GeoJSON representation. So this is already extremely close to what, uh, what Stack is doing. And on top of that, we're going to use uh, a large part of uh, stack specification for stack catalog, stack collection, and the stack API version 100. Of course, we have to, to for the moment, to preserve the existing interfaces because CIOS is using these, uh, these original interfaces as well. Now. So what is Stack doing in this, uh, in this environment? Basically, it becomes an additional interface uh, um, to be able to serve additional clients. We want to have a maximum number of clients, customers for to be able to access our, our assets. Uh, we believe that the, the notion of these nested and child catalogs uh, to, be have to, to be able to drill down via different dimensions uh, to localize the metadata of your choice using different facets, for example, by organization or by science keyword or by satellite or by instrument is, is very useful and complementary to what you already had in place. Uh, and in addition, it's very, very close to OGC API features on which we already base. So we are, we are tweaking this to be able to support all of this at the same time through a single API. Uh, what we still have to find out is what to do with stack item because when we go to the satellite extension, the SAR extension, uh, these have similar metadata today we have in the OGC specs and we would like to see if there's a possibility to do some harmonization to not have two variations of uh, um, GeoJSON features representing the same, the same information. And also because we're dealing with a lot of collections and catalogs, which sometimes are very large, we're interested in uh, support for paging also in the stack browser. So what does that mean? You see here a presentation uh, on the left-hand side of the, of the screen. You see the landing page from the OGC API features or the stack root catalog, if you want. So the idea is that we are organizing our metadata for collections. For example, you have here at the bottom with the red background, you have a typical collection, the Mary's collection from Envisat, represented as a stack catalog. And the idea is that we want to allow through user interface to drill down either through uh, sub-catalogs, which are organized by platforms or by satellites, through the Envisat catalog, you would come to there, or by organization, if you know which organization is serving the collections, you can drill down by organization. For example, this would be uh, ESA, ESRIN, and you come to that collection, or by science keyword, you would be looking for collections uh, using science keywords like atmosphere, et cetera, and arrive to the same one. And then from then, when you have the EO collection, then you can drill down further down to find the, uh, the assets for a real product, the one with the green background is a product. So the idea is to be able to drill down from top to bottom through the stack hierarchy of collections and then up to the, uh, up to the granule to the, uh, the data. So how does it look like in reality? So here you see what we have deployed, which is for the moment online, but it's work in progress. This is the stack browser. So at the top for the moment, we can drill down by platform or by organization. Uh, I will choose by organization. Uh, so I choose uh, ESA in this particular case. It shows me all the, uh, Sorry, it shows me the, the list of organizations serving the uh, serving data in the in the system. I will select ESA. I will get the list of collections uh, from uh, from the European Space Agency that are available with between brackets the number of uh, Earth collections available uh, from from that. 
and then I can find the collection that I want with the abstract EQ, et cetera, from the ISO metadata. It shows that I have 10 years of data available. Uh, they are organized as subcatalogs, and then I go to the items, which will give me an individual product uh, with the different assets, like the thumbnail, like the metadata in different flavors, and the actual download URL for the, for the product. I can do the same by platform. I would get the list of the platforms available through the system. I choose the platform in this particular case, Landsat 7. I have two collections from Landsat 7 with uh, more than 80,000 products in the ESA catalogs. Um, it shows that I have five years of data. It gives access to the thumbnails, to the metadata on the right-hand side, and of course the assets, uh, the quick look, the download product, etc. So this is for all the uh, metadata available through the FEDEO system. So we hope to have shortly an implementation of this, providing access to more than 70 million uh, granules coming from the ESA FEDEO and the ESA UCAT uh, systems through Stack through interoperable interfaces, which are basically co coexistence of existing open source interfaces, OGC API features and stack. Uh, so this would, uh, I think, be an, a nice addition to the, uh, the community. Yeah. I think that's it. If you want more information, there is a video from the stack that we did, from the sprint that we did two weeks ago, that you can find here. And I have some references at the end of my presentation. Awesome. That's it. Thanks so much. Uh, so cool to see so much data available. Um, you want to stop your screen share, and Fabian or Yura? Yes. Uh, you want to share yours? Yes, I'm trying. Um... Cool. Uh, I'll give a little intro. So uh, yeah, Fabian, it was like a year or two ago that we met. I, I forget how, but yeah, I got really interested in could someone make a pure cog uh, reader in JavaScript, which uh, you know, no server in between. Um, and I forget how we got connected, but these guys were, were up for the challenge and, and made something that worked far better than expected. Um, and okay. oh, just sorry, I just need to need to reconnect uh, with, with Zoom. I'll be here okay. in 50 seconds, okay? Cool, yeah. Um, anybody want to? ask a quick question on any of the presentations while he reconnects. Uh, I also mentioned in chat, uh, Stephen um, from Data Driven Agriculture is gonna give a talk on adoption of remote sensing in Sub-Saharan Africa. Timing didn't quite work, but we're gonna try to bring him back in um, in session two. And yeah, I think I'll try to play uh, a other videos I'll try with Fang and we'll see from Digital Earth Africa and we'll see if that works. Um, and if we have time, we also skipped um, Tom um, with PyGeo stack, PyGeo API. Uh, and I'll see about playing that one. All right, over to you, Fabian. All right, can you see my screen? Yep, we got it. Awesome, okay. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Fabian Schindler from EOX. Um, we're a small company based in Austria and we're mainly working for the European Space Agency. And we're uh, mostly dealing with Earth observation data. Um, we are also well known for our Sentinel-2 mosaic, so which is a global mosaic, cloud-free mosaic, uh, which we're trying to do a yearly version of. So if you're interested, check it out. It's all in cloud optimized GeoDiff, of course. So I'm going to introduce you to uh, GeoDiffJS, if you not, do not already know it. So it is a small JavaScript library. It's written in pure JavaScript, so it's available everywhere where JavaScript is, is, is um, accessible. So which means it's, it's available in the browser and in Node. And it's, it's um, basically a building block to um, access remote TIFFs, extract raster data, and also extract RGB imagery. What does accessing TIFF mean? So accessing means like local files. Uh, this can be either in the browser or on the, on the server side via node or remote files, which can be accessed via HTTP range request as even has beautifully shown. Um, very, very necessary for a larger files. It's, it's only fetching the required portions of the files. I'll get into that in a minute. And it's also possible to access the metadata of, um, for example, geospatial metadata and everything else. Raster data is, is um, the most important thing is to, to make a subset um, so that you do not need to download a, a huge portion of the file. So this can be done either by a bonding box image window, or you can select a specific sub window 
or a specific component. So for RGB data, you can choose to only um, load the, the red component. It's also necessary to, to decompress the data and maybe resample. And it's also possible to make an automatic selection of the overview if you uh, specify a bounding box and uh, resolution. Um, GTFTH also provides a very basic transformation of raw data to viewable images. This can be like a, a grayscale image for, for most of the data, or if it's already some sort of viewable color space, then it may trans, trans, can transform the color space to RGB. Also can expand color lookup tables. But this, as I said, this is very, very, very basic. And this is the point where uh, more sophisticated um, applications come into play. For example, the Cloud Optimized Geodiff Explorer, which is a um, small app and basically a proof of concept um, to explore um, potentially huge TIFF files in the browser. And um, it is an open layers based web map application and it uses WebGL for efficient rendering. And this is how it looks like. So you have um, a backdrop map and on top of it a GeoTIFF map. Then you can basically zoom into the into the image and it uh, gradually loads all the data that it actually needs and performs the visualization. Visualization can um, either be RGB as we have currently seen, or it can also make uh, co color composites, for example, for this Lancet scene, uh, where uh, several options are already uh, displayed. So for example, you can select uh, different color composites. Um, the data is actually U in 16, so it needs to be stretched and, and uh, prepared for actual visualization, and which is done here. So you can um, provide a couple of, of color filters to make a nice visualization. Uh, this worked so well that we actually chose to use it in the EuroDataCube uh, data cube application um, as the default um, or viewer for. Or orders are actually stack catalogs, so just just a small beside. Um, so this is basically just the same Cork Explorer with only minor adaptions. Um, next up, uh, we're working with uh, this guy, the Ivan Sanchez Apteka. So he's a very talented guy, and we want to basically uh, move the idea of the Cork Explorer to the next level and have a very simple way to um, use geotiffs and, and uh, similar data in an open layers map application. And it basically combines all the, the components that we have already seen, but in a very simple way. So you have GUT for data reading, we have WebGL for rendering, and everything is put on the open layers map. And this is what it looks like. So the data set is, is actually um, a single band Korean lens, date, lens cover data set, which is colorized using the shader from, from uh, the bottom side of the screen. Um, but the real power is that you can actually make on the fly calculations with, um, with the shaders provided. And for example, here can you simply, simply show the difference between the Corinne uh, 2012 and 2018 versions. Um, this project will be landing soon, I hope, and um, will be uh, even easier to view GeoTIFF images in the browser. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, awesome. Thanks for that preview. It's a surprise. Looking forward to that one coming out. Um, Rock, are you around? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Can you share your okay, screen? So I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yep, we got it. Take it away. Okay, so hello, everyone. My name is Rock. I work uh, for Synergize, uh, a small Slovenian company, and I work on the Sentinel Hub. So short introduction to Sentinel Hub to those who are not familiar with it. Sentinel Hub is a set of, uh, oh, problem, sorry. Sentinel Hub is a set of APIs which hide the complexity of storing, processing, and distribution of all the satellite imagery. It provides access to the global archives of uh, Sentinels, Landsat, MODIS, and some more. All this is done over OGC protocols, so WMS, WCS, 
and also via our internal RESTful APIs. All of those can be integrated into various desktop or web applications. We also have some mobile applications using them. And also it's very nice for large scale uh, machine learning workflows. But not about that today. Today we're talking about the stack API we implemented on the top of all this uh, data. So to render and show users all this imagery, we internally already had all, a lot of metadata stored for years now. So, but this at the moment, at the times wasn't uh, shown publicly. So I don't know, three years ago, we started with the WFS series since the time stack didn't exist. And it seemed like a well, good follow up from the other OGC protocols. But WFS has a lot of uh, various problems uh, when we're talking about the satellite imagery. So in recently, I don't know what's it now, three, four months ago, we released uh, all the metadata via the stack API. So the stack API currently we're supporting a bit older version, so 0 0.9. Uh, we haven't yet moved to beta since we're lazy and uh, waiting for the final beta probably. Our stack API supports most of the extensions that are that bring the all the other features that are needed internally and externally by the users. We also added uh, well one internal extension that's called for now distinct. What it does, it basically creates a summary of data over a specific uh, bounding box and specific time frame. So for example, if a user wants to know which for which dates Sentinel-2 scenes are available, they can do this using the distinct uh, extension. Or I don't know, if user is interested uh, for Sentinel-1 data, which uh, uh, equipment modes are used or and things like that. So this is something that we use a lot for our web applications when we're displaying data and it's yeah, useful to have all these summaries. Also, stack item extensions are used depending on the collection. So for example, Sentinel-2 is gonna use the EO extension and Sentinel-1 is gonna use SAR extension. So due to all this history, how the stack catalog came to be, uh, we have some technical limitations on what uh, we're displaying and how we're dealing with uh, the vast amount of uh, data. So as I said, first this was internal catalog. So the catalog was only storing the data that we needed to use to render images. So a lot of other data that's interesting to the users is not in there. We're adding slowly and mostly it's by requests of the users and yeah, you see how it goes. But otherwise, yeah, storing uh, a large number of items in a database causes uh, problems with uh, the storage and the indices and with all the extensions to the stack API, uh, we still want uh, the API to be really fast. So we added some uh, limitations onto the top of our stack API, which are not in the line with the official stack API uh, specifications, but yeah, otherwise uh, things wouldn't work. So all in all, what's available in our stack API, currently, we have metadata on various satellites, so from Landsat to all the Sentinels and some MODIS uh, data across uh, various uh, data providers. So from AWS to DSS, which are European Commission's initiatives to store 
and distribute uh, satellite imagery. Uh, and also we have some of these uh, collections uh, that are called uh, bring your own uh, cloud optimized duties. So it's an option, a feature that users can uh, upload their own cloud optimized duties and, uh, and afterwards they are available to our services. So all of this is also available to the to the stack API. Altogether, it should be around I don't know 60 million or something like that. So that should be all of this uh, short uh, overview of the stack API. Everyone is welcome uh, to try it out. Here is the link to our web page and to the documentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Robin. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. Um, you stop your screen, Rock. Okay. And you should be able to share, Robin. Yeah, I'm sharing. Awesome. Looks good. All right. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yep. We're all good. All right. So um, we're from the USGS, and I'm Robin Ferguson. And my team consists of Jay Laura, who is um, who does our software development and our stack implementation. Mark Hunter is our metadata specialist, and Trent Hare is our expert on standards and data access. So well, we're still figuring things out, but I'm really excited about the potential that Stack brings to planetary data delivery. So first, to tell you a little bit about us, because we're not the standard USGS. So we work at the USGS Astrogeology Science Center, and almost all of our funding comes directly from NASA. We do a wide variety of work, but the role that's most relevant to what I'm presenting here is that we develop software that allows images to be projected onto a planetary surface, and we use that software in collaboration with missions to create data processing pipelines. The software also includes a custom bundle adjustment software and other tools that we use to correct errors in our knowledge of spacecraft position, and, those, and the placement of those images on the surface. And then we provide those improved data to the public. So this is the problem we're trying to address. In planetary science, data is typically publicly available as a minimally processed image product. And the community spends a huge amount of time and redundant effort processing data for scientific use. In fact, I'd guess that at least a third, um, if not more, of our time as scientists is spent finding data and preparing it for analysis. So data providers and portals are trying to provide a solution. And on the screen here, you see two of the more popular data portals for Mars. The bottom is JMARS. The, um, the top one is called MarsTrack. But they're also pro um, processing all of their own data as well at a significant cost to their projects. And it's a really, really steep learning curve to process many of these data sets. And that not only takes away from scientific investigation or even developing a really sweet portal, but it's also a significant barrier to any individual who wants to learn how to use a new data set. And I have to wonder how much effort is wasted on preparing data for analysis when instead we could collectively be using that energy for learning and science discovery. How much does this redundant effort cost us in terms of knowledge and understanding? So we're trying to remove this barrier by using Stack by using our expertise to provide data that's ready for immediate analysis. And we're using a stat catalog to enable searching in a very straightforward and standardized way. Our goal is not only to provide data to scientists, but also to provide data to these portals and tools that could, adjust, that could ingest that already processed data directly into their tools and serve that to their users as well. So we've spent the last few months understanding the stack standard and learning how to apply that standard to planetary data. Um, this video clip demonstrates our current progress with a prototype QGIS plugin that queries a stat compliant catalog of infrared data from Mars using Elasticsearch, and then also based on a user defining a location of interest. I think you might have seen like a really small red box. That's the user defining a location, uh, a location of interest, and then images can be streamed directly um, into the QGIS um, application. So any COG images that fall within that user defined location are streamed directly to the application. And this eliminates the need for the user to process data and also the need to download data onto their hard drive or local server. Because honestly, most planetary data is now not cloud enabled yet. Everybody still has a big server under their desk and have huge amounts of data 
um, right at their fingertips. So this is a, a culture and a paradigm shift for at least the planetary community. So we also run into hurdles when applying terrestrial standards to the planetary data because most standards are hard-coded to WGS84, which is a problem for us. <laughs> so we appreciate how simple the stack schema is and how body agnostic it is all on its own. So even with all of the WGS and related challenges, we're working really hard not to make our data special by maximizing the use of the stack core and existing extensions. We are developing a planetary extension, but we're grappling with the question of whether or not this is really even necessary, whether or not we could collaborate with other standards that are really close and other extensions that are really close and just modify those extensions so that they're um, planetary body agnostic. So we have funding to continue this work and we're planning to distribute images and data and digital terrain models of Europa that are projected to the correct location on that body. That's old um, Viking and Galileo Galileo flyby data and that kind of that style of data notoriously has a lot of errors in our, in our understanding of the position of a spacecraft. So um, being able to correct the location on the body is really, really useful for that community. That's a huge amount of data processing that they're not going to have to do on their own. Um, these data sets will support mission planning and scientific preparation for the Clipper mission to Europa, which is scheduled to launch in 2024. And that's it. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks so much, Robin. This is super cool to see. I think it's one of my favorite things working in open communities when somebody does something that you literally did not imagine. And I definitely did not imagine <laughs> that CONCOG would be used for planetary data. I mean, it makes tons of sense, but just beyond me. So uh, super, super cool to see. Um, awesome. Uh, Scott, you there? I'm here. Awesome. You want to share your screen? Oh, it should be... Oh, good lord, I'm going to grant privacy access. Sorry about that. One moment. No worries. I'll give a little quick intro. So Scott uh, leads the, the interoperability program at OGC. I've been working with him for a number of years. Um, and yeah, we've been talking a lot recently about how we, we merge the, the streams with um, Cloud Native Geospatial and, and, and the Open Geospatial Consortium. We've um, always seen that and certainly comes back as an intent and in building on top of it. And um, yeah, he's going to share a bit about um, OGC and Cloud Native Geospatial. Over to you, Scott. Great. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening in. So again, Scott Simmons with the uh, Open Geospatial Consortium, OGC. You've heard quite a bit uh, of our of the, those three letters in previous presentations. Just real quick, if you're not aware of who the OGC is, uh, we are a consortium of over 500 members that focus on all things location. We write standards, we develop best practices, we do all sorts of experiments, but again, it's all based on uh, achieving consensus around how to handle location information. Uh, our membership divided roughly evenly between the commercial, government, and research sectors. Uh, so we have good representation from across the community, uh, not just geospatial operations, but also larger IT infrastructure uh, organizations and large government agencies. Today, I want to talk more about what we're doing with respect to our mission to make all things fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable from a cloud native perspective, right? So to make data findable, your users expect to be able to find this content regardless of the architecture under which the content is provided. Uh, access to the content should also be consistent and consumable in a way that everyone can use it. You want your content to be interoperable. That means if you pull imagery from one service and a second service, you want to be able to do cross uh, imagery analysis against those two different services. You want the data to be interoperable. And finally, the whole concept of finding something once, using it many times, ensuring that data is reusable. And so adequately cataloging and tagging your data to indicate those best use cases for why it should be reusable. Um, if you take a look at some work we did in Testbed 15 last year in OGC, I've got a link at the bottom, uh, you can see some really good experiments around this entire concept. The way we want to realize this is in three kind of pieces. One, you want this foundation to be very predictable. Just like in basketball where you want every single free throw to be made, it should be the most boring part of the game. Similarly, discovery and access of your content should be really boring. You should be able to always consistently and predictably find and use your content. Reliability, the handoff of data from discovery to consumption and exploitation needs to be utterly reliable. 
when you find content, you do not want to then have to do a whole bunch of machinations to be able to access and use that content. Rather, you want a simple handoff from your discovery to your use of the content. And then finally, you want to have a high level of flexibility with respect to how you access and use these content uh, sources. Just as any cloud data store might be in any one of uh, a number of architectures and models for how content might be stored and distributed, your standards and your access patterns need to be flexible enough to work across all of those different means. And so with respect to flexibility, I want to harp just a little bit more on this one because it's really important uh, from what we're doing at OGC is we have a legacy of building really comprehensive and thus really complex standards that try to cover every one of those edge cases. And if it's complex enough, it is technically flexible, but it's a complete brute to implement. So those of you that have implemented all the W star S standards realize how hard they can be to implement, but they might offer great flexibility at that cost. The approach you want to take now is really to work against small, simple standards that do the little things and building blocks and then you can integrate those little pieces together and build something that's only as complex as you need it to be. And that's what makes the architecture so interesting and what makes a lot of these other standards for cloud native geospatial objects uh, so, so applicable. And so where are these things fitting within OGC these days? Um, GeoTIFF is an OGC standard at the moment. It's been developed and optimized uh, over the last few years for a standardized uh, description of the standard. The GeoTIFF Standards Working Group is considering should STOG, COG, sorry, be standardized as an extension, a formalized extension of GeoTIFF so that it also is managed as a standard. Um, and what are the governance things about COG and other means by which we may want to enhance GeoTIFF. Uh, STACK currently a valid profile of OGC API features standard uh, that you and others talked about a little bit earlier. And right now, Chris and I are working on uh, pushing forward stat uh, for consideration as endorsement as an OGC community standard. That means endorsing this as a standard, but letting the stack management continue in its current environment and just have OGC membership use it as a normative standard. And then there's other work going on in OGC that's relevant. So all the OGC API standards, about seven of which are currently under development. Uh, we have standardized the model for HDF5, and ZAR is being considered right now as a potential community standard as well. And so looking at all the other cloud-friendly things out there as part of the bigger picture. And so with that, thank you for letting me share a little bit of this uh, background and happy to follow up with anyone as needed. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, so I think that's all the live ones. Can you stop your sharing? I'm going to make another attempt at um, the Digital Earth Africa talk. Let me know if the audio works. Um, maybe it'll have a lot better luck than Ahmed. Uh, share screen. I have two tries to make as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Fong Yuan. Works. Works? Sweet. OK. Uh, Fong Young will uh, be talking on Digital Earth Africa uh, for the next five minutes. I'm a conservation data scientist working at Geoscience Australia in Canberra. I'm currently co-leading product development activities in the Digital Earth Africa establishment team. As a data scientist, enjoy working with different types of data. I'm really excited. Ah, Hello, everyone. Sorry. My name is Fong Yuan. I'm an Earth Observation Data Scientist working at Geoscience Australia in Canberra. I'm currently co-leading product development activities in the Digital Earth Africa establishment team. As a data scientist, enjoy working with different types of data. I'm really excited to be presenting to you today. And thanks, Chris, for putting together such an exciting program. I'm looking forward to be watching other talks in the daytime here. I'm going to give a very brief overview of the Digital Earth Africa program. My colleague, Alex Lees, has given a more in-depth technical demo in the intro session. You can find more information about our program from our website, and you're also welcome to contact me directly at the email address shown at the end of this talk. Digital Earth Africa is in its three year establishment phase. We're about half year through. The establishment team is led by Geoscience Australia, but with members based in Australia, Africa, and in US. And we're finding and training teams in Africa 
that will be able to take over so that eventually the program will be run in Africa for Africa. Digital Earth Africa is a platform powered by Open Data Cube. We take Earth observation data taken by satellite, make them easily accessible and easily used, and we turn them into information product that can support decision making and also help address challenges faced by the African community. This may be resource management, food security, or sustainable development goals. In the beginning, this little person sitting in front of a computer working with data, maybe me and my teammates in the establishment team, but we're already starting to work with other users. And eventually we want you and more people in the geospatial community, more data scientists and domain experts to be able to work with our data. First product we released is about water. We use satellite observations to map the occurrence of surface water. And I don't have to remind you how important water is. Water systems are often dynamic and can be related to many different types of challenges. Here's a news story that my colleague in Africa brought up yesterday. It's about two expanding lakes in Kenya. There are lots of images showing how the rising water is causing damages to houses nearby. So we went on to our map portal, loaded up water observations from space product. And on the left hand side, I'm showing the water extent mapped in 1984. Well, on the right hand side, it's showing the water extent in 2019. As you can see, the two lakes have expanded significantly. And we will have data covering the entire Africa. So we can map all the expanding and shrinking water bodies. And this is going to be a powerful tool to help understand the water systems across Africa. The next theme we're hoping to address is food security. And Sentinel-2 is one of the data set we're hoping to use. In this example, I'm showing Sentinel-2 time series in true color on the left-hand side for an area in South Africa. On the right-hand side, it's the so-called normalized difference vegetation index derived from visible and near infrared observations, highlighting vegetation. So you can tell easily when crops have been planted, how they grow, and when they're harvested. We're hoping to use similar method and more sophisticated models to map the crop area across Africa. The Sentinel-2 data you've just seen come at up to 10 meter resolution and it covers the entire Africa every five days. We already have 1.5 petabytes of Sentinel-2 data in AWS ready for you to play. And the next couple of months, we're getting more data, including land surface temperature data and also synthetic aperture radar that allow us to see through the clouds. And most importantly, there are going to be in cloud optimized GeoTIFF with stack metadata. So I hope you're all as excited as I am and I encourage you to try out our platform. And I'm really looking forward to working with you all to realize the full potential of this vast amount of data. Thank you and good luck with the spring. Awesome. And uh, it looks like we're just about up on the hour and we'll go into the intro sessions. Um, we skipped over one talk, um, PyGeo API. Um, I have a recording from Tom and I'll try to, to give it at the end. Um, and then Stephen uh, from Data Driven Agriculture will also uh, talk in the next session. Hopefully we can fit them all, um, but we'll definitely figure it out. Um, so yeah, thank you to, to every speaker. That uh, was an incredible array of awesome stuff. Um, I really appreciate everyone sharing. Um, and yeah, I think people have asked a couple of times, we'll do our best to get these talks posted, um, hopefully quickly, but uh, with a few of us trying to, to work a way to do that um, so that people can can watch soon after we, we have them up. But I think we've got to cut the sessions up and, and whatnot. Um, and then, yeah, next we're going to shift to the intro sessions um, for uh, the next two hours. We have three tracks. Um, uh, 
track one uh, will introduce the um, uh, data labeling contest. Um, so definitely join that one if you want to and then go into machine learning and uh, some other great topics. Um, and yeah, check the agenda. The Zoom connection in info is all on the calendar and in your email. Um, and yeah, let us know uh, if you have problems. Kevin Booth is also online with Radiant Earth and will help um, get it set up. And yeah, um, so yeah, feel free to join a session, um, an intro session. Uh, they're 40 minutes long um, and we'll go from sort of one to the next in each track. And then we'll all convene back in a couple hours and do uh, the final stretch of lightning talks. Um, thanks so much. And I'll think I'll stop this. Oh, maybe I'll leave it open. No, I will stop uh, for everyone so that we can hopefully record and post it if I have the ability to stop. No. Hey, Kevin, do you want to try to end the meeting for all? Or anybody else have any quick words? Cool. Uh, okay, I'll end it. Yeah, see if you can end for all so that we can get the recording up sooner rather than having it continue to run. Cool. Awesome.